Hello, this is Nikki Going. Welcome to session four of our discussions on the crucible. In this section, we, we will be discussing the second half of Act One. And as always, it's important that you know exactly what happens in the scene. So we'll start with a brief overview of the plot from this point onwards. So ask yourself what happens. This section starts when Rebecca Nurse quiets Betty. Remember that Betty had started screaming and clapped her, her hands over her ears when she heard the singing of the psalm from downstairs. And everyone comes running upstairs and Rebecca Nurse just sits quietly with her and gets Betty to calm down. This is followed by a big argument at Betty's bedside between Giles, Proctor and the Putnams. Hale then arrives at the height of the argument and the tension and Paris suddenly changes his mind. You'll remember that up to this point in this act, Paris has been adamant that no witchcraft has actually occurred. At least that's what he publicly claims, even though he has very strong suspicions. But now he changes his mind and he admits to witchcraft. He actually starts accusing Abigail and bear in mind that in accusing Abigail, he is implying that his own daughter, Betty, is also guilty of witchcraft, along with the other girls in the village. Abigail then accuses Tichiba of witchcraft. Tichiba confesses to witchcraft, and I put it in quotation marks because we know that the witchcraft in Tichiba's case probably didn't actually occur. And Abigail, watching this, decides that she too will confess to witchcraft and starts naming other witches. Betty then names other witches and the act closes. So as we proceed through this act, there are a number of questions that you need to ask yourself. Firstly, you need to ask yourself why Paris changes his mind. So Paris started off by suspecting witchcraft at the beginning of Act 1, and he called the doctor and Reverend Hale into Salem to disprove witchcraft. Then he changes his mind and he accuses Abigail of witchcraft. He then encourages the girls to confess to witchcraft and by the end of Act 1 he actually leads the witchcraft accusations. Another character that changes her story is Abigail and again you need to ask yourself why. To begin with she denies witchcraft telling her uncle Paris it was sport uncle then she admits to dancing around a pot and a fire. Then she accuses Tichiba of witchcraft. And finally, she confesses to witchcraft and names other witches. The major themes that we'll be discussing in this section of Act 1 are the motives for the witchcraft accusations. This is probably the most important theme in the whole of Act 1 because in Act 1, Miller sets us up to understand why these characters go on and accuse others of witchcraft. And Act 1 is all about establishing their motives and reasons for doing so. We also find out about differing attitudes to evil, um, which is linked to the idea of a dualistic worldview, which I'll explain in more detail. The idea of reputation and the tension between reputation and integrity, which is linked to who has power in Salem and who doesn't. Remember that reputation actually becomes a form of currency for obtaining power in the, in the society of Salem. We see the danger of having faith in faith. And the evidence of witchcraft is satirized by Miller and I'll explain a little bit more about that as we go along, which is linked to what was happening in the USA at the time of Miller's writing this text and the McCarthy trials that he was seeing going on around him. Around him. Again, we see the complete underestimation of children in this act, largely by the male characters, and how their underestimation of children actually results in characters like Abigail, Mary Warren, and Mercy Lewis gaining an enormous amount of power. We're going to be seeing some imagery that continues throughout this act, and in fact for the rest of the play. So the important imagery is again this idea of a battle between heaven, the forces of goodness, and hell, and the forces of evil. And this imagery is linked to the color imagery, where white is often 
shown in opposition to the colors of black and red. Um, and this is an imagery, imagery that ties into the idea of a supernatural battle. We also see more animal imagery. And again, in this animal imagery, you'll see that there's going to be a contrasting of opposites. And we have the introduction of some new imagery, the idea of layers of reality and hidden truths. So to begin with, in this section, we meet Rebecca Nurse. We meet Rebecca Nurse when she calms uh, Betty down just by sitting by her bedside. And this is how it starts. Everyone ran upstairs as Betty sat up and started screaming. Then, according to Miller's stage directions, Rebecca walks across the room to the bed. Gentleness exudes from her. Betty is quietly whimpering, eyes shut. Rebecca simply stands over the child, who gradually quiets. And of course, the important factor about the nurses is that they have absolute integrity. And at this stage of the play, they also have a lot of power because their integrity has led to them having a good reputation. Paradoxically, these are also some of the motives for witchcraft accusations against the nurses. So at this point in the play, Francis and Rebecca Nurse are very, very well respected. Um, Francis Nurse is often called upon as an unofficial judge in Salem when there's tension between the residents. They own large tracts of land in Salem, which makes them, in financial terms, very, very powerful. They have a big family and are well established in Salem with a respectable history. And Miller points out in his long note on the nurses that in fact these factors which give them power, which give them a good reputation, also lead eventually to their downfall because these factors are reasons for envy against them. So for example, Francis Nurse was not always wealthy. To begin with, he rented the land that he worked, and he saved his money and worked his way towards land ownership. He worked for his money and his success, and it suggested that he is greatly envied in Salem because of this. Um, Miller also describes how the nurses are involved in a land war with the Putnams that at one stage had even reached the stage of a, of a two-day battle in the streets of Salem. We find out that the nurses voted against Putnam's original choice of minister, his brother-in-law Bailey, which means that Putnam really detests the nurses. The nurses also worked with people whose farms uh, lay adjacent to their own farm, and because they objected to the power structures in Salem and they didn't get on with Paris and they clashed with Putnam, they actually set up a whole new township which they called Topsfield, and obviously the people of Salem really resented this. And then finally, Mrs. Putnam really envies Rebecca's many children. So at this point, we meet Rebecca Nurse, and when Rebecca Nurse calms Betty Paris down, Mrs. Putnam responds with astonishment and says, what have you done? So you can read this simply as she's really surprised that Betty has calmed down. But in retrospect, when we read later on in the play that Mrs. Putnam is behind the accusations of witchcraft against Rebecca Nurse, you can see that here she's already beginning to suspect Rebecca Nurse. And possibly her suspicions are grounded in her very deep envy of Rebecca Nurse. In fact, when she charges Rebecca Nurse with witchcraft, she says that Rebecca's spirit had tempted her to iniquity. Iniquity means wickedness. And Miller comments in his note, this is a charge that had more truth in it than Mrs. Putnam could know. Okay. Now, one of the things we gather about Rebecca Nurse as she sits next to Betty's bedside is that she is the voice of common sense and reason. She's the closest that we come to Miller's own opinion on the events in the play. And she says to the Putnams about um, Betty Paris, but also she's talking about, um, sorry, <laughs> Ruth, Ruth Putnam. She says, I think she'll wake in time. Pray calm yourselves. 
I have 11 children and I'm 26 times a grandma and I've seen them all through their silly seasons and when it come on them, they will run the devil bow-legged keeping up with their mischief. I think she'll wake when she tires of it. So when she looks at Betty Paris, she's not seeing a child possessed by, by demons or evil spirits. She's simply seeing a very scared little girl who is pretending to be possessed because she is too scared to wake up. And she thinks that if everyone is just calm around her, Betty will recover on her own. And Mrs. Putnam responds with, This is no silly season, Rebecca. And of course, this highlights two very different attitudes towards evil, or what can be described as a dualistic worldview. Now, the word dual means two, okay? So the one attitude towards evil is that evil is internal, that everyone is actually capable of evil, and that evil at, and that the evil within a person is mixed up with their capacity for goodness. And this is the way that Rebecca Nurse would see evil. She would see everybody as having the potential for evil and everybody as hopefully fighting a lifelong battle to overcome their own internal evil and to become good and eventually die and go to heaven. Um, and this idea of evil is depicted in the painting on the left, which is a detail called Christ carrying the cross from a painting by Hieronymus Bosch. The painting on the right depicts Mrs. Putnam's view of evil, and in fact the view of evil that most of the people in Salem have. It's a painting called The Good and Evil Angels Struggling for the Possession of a Child, painted by the artist William Blake. Now in this painting on the right you can see an evil angel who's wrapped in a cloak of flames fighting with a good angel who's holding a baby, and the baby represents an innocent soul. And you can see that they are engaged in, an, in a battle for this child and for the soul. And this is in fact how most of the people of Salem saw the forces of good and evil. They saw evil as being personified and embodied by the figure of Satan or the devil and Satan constantly fighting for the souls of humanity with angels. So for them the earth was a battleground between these two sets of supernatural forces. So if we're going to sum up these different attitudes towards evil, the one view is the view of evil as being internal. So this is how Rebecca Nurse would see it, that evil is inside everyone, that you cannot easily separate or define evil when comparing it to good. And she would say that people must take responsibility for their own evil desires and behavior. And she in fact sees that the, the, that the practice of projecting evil or seeing it as coming from outside of oneself is a very, very dangerous one because it allows people to avoid responsibility for their own wrongdoing. The other view of evil is this dualistic one where evil is seen as external, personified by the devil. Evil is seen as completely opposite to good and, and as something that can easily be separated from good. And of course, with this view of the world, people were able to say that they hadn't committed evil, they had been possessed by an external evil spirit, and therefore their wrongdoings were not their fault. So it allowed them to displace and project the blame for their own evil behavior onto others, which of course is a very, very dangerous attitude and a dangerous belief to hold because it sets up all the preconditions that were required for the witchcraft trials. So some of the motives for witchcraft accusations are this idea of dualistic thought. And of course, it's linked to the McCarthy trials in the United States in the 1950s at the time of Miller writing The Crucible. And Miller has this to say in his long note on, um, on the subject. Like Reverend Hale and the others on this stage, we conceive the devil as a necessary part of a respectable view of cosmology. Ours is a divided empire in which certain ideas and emotions and actions are of God and their opposites are of Lucifer. It is as impossible for most men to conceive of a morality without sin as of an earth without sky. The world is still gripped between two diametrically opposed absolutes. So here he was basically saying 
that we still have a tendency to see the world in this dualistic way, just like Mrs. Putnam. We tend to see evil as an external force and to blame our own actions and wrongdoings on forces outside of ourselves. And in this, we, we see this in Miller's notes on Hale. So other motives for the witchcraft accusations, we have to pity these people. They had very limited scientific and medical knowledge. And therefore, when they didn't understand something that had happened in their world, they blamed it either on the will of God, which they tended to attribute to things that were good, or on witchcraft. Um, they also seem to be suffering from a sense of growing paranoia, paranoia being an irrational fear of things that one cannot control. And one of the reasons for this growing paranoia was the fact that Salem was a very new or relatively new and vulnerable settlement. We know that these people had only settled in this area of Massachusetts for about 30 years, and they still didn't feel completely safe. And some of the imagery that reinforces this idea of them occupying a supernatural battlefield is when Mrs. Putnam says, there are wheels within wheels in this village and fires within fires. So here you can see that sense of paranoia, that sense that there is a threatening uh, set of forces underlying what looks like a very innocent and normal reality, that there are forces at work that people cannot see and cannot control. And of course, that's linked to their motives for later accusing others of witchcraft. And um, Miller describes how in his first long prose passage, how to the people of Salem, the edge of the wilderness was close by. The American continent stretched endlessly west, and it was full of mystery for them. It stood dark and threatening over their shoulders night and day, for out of it Indian tribes marauded from time to time. And the Salem folk believed that the virgin forest was the devil's last preserve, his home base, and the citadel of his final stand. It is not hard to see how easily many could have been led to believe that the time of confusion had been brought upon them by deep and darkling forces. So remember that at this stage at w in which the play is set, America had not yet been colonized um, by European countries uh, to any great extent. And in fact, most of the colonies were tiny little villages clinging to the edge of the eastern seaboard. So for them, the whole of America, all the way to the west coast, was unexplored, it was unknown, and it was occupied by the people that they called Indians, nowadays more politically correctly called Native American Indians. And because these people were not Christian, they regarded them as basically satanic and forces of evil. So you can see that they felt enormously threatened all the time. Um, Rebecca, of course, being very sensible, realizes how dangerous it is that the people of Salem are starting to look to supernatural forces as an explanation for why Ruth Putnam and Betty Paris are in this state of seeming bewitchment. And she says to Paris, Mr. Paris, I think you'd best send Reverend Hale back as soon as he come. This will set us all to arguing again in the society. And we thought to have peace this year. I think we ought to rely on the doctor now and good prayer. And Mrs. Putnam responds, Rebecca, the doctor's baffled. The subtext there is she believes that, in fact, these children are bewitched. And Rebecca answers, let us go to God for the cause of it. There is prodigious danger in the seeking of loose spirits. I fear it. I fear it. Let us rather blame ourselves and... So here, of course, you can see that she feels that any evil in the village of Salem is internal. It's not caused by witches and the devil. It's caused by people behaving badly themselves. And Putnam responds with, how may we blame ourselves? I am one of nine sons. The Putnam seed has peopled this province, and yet I have but one child left of eight, and now she shrivels. So Rebecca, as I said, is the voice of reason. She opposes this simplistic, dualistic view of good and evil. And she argues that people should take responsibility for the evil in the village. Another thing that we see as 
happens before the arrival of hail is a power struggle and the enormous dislike that people have for Paris. So Paris is seen as greedy and obsessed and constantly preaching about hell. We find out that he's very, very insecure. And one of the reasons that he's insecure is he, he is accused of numerous things. So he's accused by John Proctor of using the village of Salem as a bag to swing about his head. In other words, being manipulative and trying to gain power by playing power games. He is um, accused of being incredibly greedy. He's accused of, um, of being materialistic and of using hell as a way of threatening people into cooperation with him. We see that he's very insecure. He says, I am your third preacher in seven years. I do not wish to be put out like the cat whenever some majority feels the whim. You people seem not to comprehend that a minister is the Lord's man in the parish. A minister is not to be so lightly crossed and contradicted. And of course, what we're seeing here is that there is a growing tension between theocracy, which actually rules Salem at this point, and democratic ideas which are on the increase. So remember, theocracy is the idea or the practice of a church governing the state. So the church and the state are not separate. Whatever decisions the church makes applies to the general government. Democracy is government by and for the people, and the church is not involved in a democratic government. Autocracy, which is another concept we'll discuss, is absolute rule, where no one may question government. And that absolute rule is carried out by one person or a small group. So, as I said, there's a growing tension between the theocracy that rules Salem, which is uh, embodied or personified by Paris. He's the head of the church in Salem, and therefore he is the head of the theocracy. He basically represents the will of God on earth, and he is the government to all intents and purposes and democratic ideas, which are increasingly proposed by people like the proctors, the nurses, and the Corys. So when Paris says in an absolute rage, what, are we Quakers? We are not Quakers here yet, Mr. Proctor. And you may tell that to your followers. There is a party in this church. I am not blind. There is a faction and a party. When he refers to Quakers, the Quakers were another religious sect that were absolutely democratic in their religious practices. So the Quakers never even had ministers. They simply used to get together and pray, and whoever felt that they had a prayer to say or a reading that they had to deliver would simply do it. And they had no hierarchy in their churches. And, of course, that's what Paris is objecting to. He feels that um, Proctor and the nurses and the Corys have started a faction, a divisive movement against him. And Proctor, of course, doesn't reassure him because he responds with, why then I must find it and join it. Okay, now Miller comments on a paradox in this section. He, and a paradox, just to remind you, is two ideas that seem to contradict each other, and they seem to be illogical when they're together, but they actually in combination make a greater sense or actually tell a, a deeper truth. So Miller says, the Salem tragedy developed from a paradox. For good purposes, even high purposes, the people of Salem developed a theocracy, a combine of state and religious power whose function was to keep the community together and to prevent any kind of disunity that might open it to destruction. So He's basically saying that when the people of Salem first settled in Massachusetts, they were so vulnerable and they were struggling so hard for survival, they couldn't afford to have a democratic government. They all had to act in unison. There could be no questioning of orders, and therefore a theocracy worked for them. Evidently, the time came in New England when the repressions of order were heavier than seemed warranted by the dangers against which the order was organized. So they came to a point where they felt safe enough and secure enough that the theocracy and the autocracy that governed Salem seemed unreasonable. And then you had the start of independent thought and questioning of the theocracy, which is the beginning of democratic thought. The witch hunt was a perverse manifestation of the panic which set in when the balance began to turn towards greater individual freedom.
And that's what Miller has to say in his first long prose passage. Sorry, pardon the little square. So, Paris identifies this growing democratic thought as very dangerous, both to the theocracy and to himself. And again, we have this imagery of a supernatural battle. He says there is either obedience or the church will burn like hell is burning. So he's implying that that absolute division between heaven and hell, which in his view is as it should be, will be blurred and the church will become something hellish and destructive. And of course, ironically, that is exactly what's going to happen in Act uh, 2, 3, and 4. So at this point, we can ask ourselves, who has power in Salem and why? So we have, the, we have Paris, Putnam's, Corey, Proctor's, and the nurses that seem to be engaged in a power struggle. Rebecca Nurse tells uh, um, Paris that he talks too much about hell. That's why people are not bringing their children to the meeting house. Proctor accuses Paris of being materialistic. He says that he talks so much about mortgages, he feels like he's in a, an auction house when he goes to the meeting house. Um, Paris objects and says that he's owed a 66 pound salary and he's, he gets told in fact that his salary is 60 pounds plus six pounds for firewood. And then Paris also says that he feels that he should have the deeds to the Salem Meeting House because he lives in the upstairs portion. He actually wants to own the Meeting House. And, of course, the Putnams and the Proctors and the Corys, they all point out that no previous minister has ever owned the Meeting House. So you can see that all these powerful people in Salem society are struggling against one another. Beneath them in the power hierarchy are Abigail and Betty. They're still under suspicion of witchcraft. Betty still seems to be possessed. And then right at the bottom is Tichiba, powerless black woman and a slave. And we're going to look at how that power shifts and why. So at this point, when everyone is fighting in Salem, it is no accident that that's when Reverend Hale walks in. Because Miller is pointing out that symbolically, Salem is ready for the witchcraft trials. We've got all the preconditions necessary for the witchcraft trials. We've got paranoia. We've got fighting. We've got envy. We've got greed. We've got fear. So Hale arrives as they are arguing. In contrast to Paris, who is also a reverend, we see that Hale has complete integrity and he maintains his integrity, his honesty, his goodness throughout the play. He has a very deep religious faith, and he doesn't use religion cynically as a way to manipulate others. He has very pure motives and the best of intentions, which is why it is so ironic that these very qualities, his faith in his faith, his great intentions, his total integrity, actually lead to suffering, bloodshed, and eventually, in Act 3 and 4, his loss of faith in his own faith. But when he arrives, he completely believes in what he is doing. He believes that he is capable of actually identifying and capturing and prosecuting witches. And Miller describes how when he, when, he, when he made his way to the village of Salem, Hale saw that the road from Beverly is unusually busy this morning. And he has passed a hundred rumors that make him smile at the ignorance of the Yen Marie in this most precise science. His goal is light, goodness, and its preservation. So there is a hint here that Hale's actually quite arrogant. He compares himself to ignorant peasants, that's what a yearman is, and um, sees himself as much, much more knowledgeable, much, much more in control. And of course, Miller is satirizing this arrogance. And of course, he is also satirizing the kind of mindset that he saw in 1950s America, where people believed that they could clearly identify who was good and who was evil, who was working for the capitalists, which they would have seen as the side of good, and who was a communist supporter, which they would have seen as the, as the side of complete evil. Um, Hale then starts interviewing 
the people of Salem, and he listens to the so-called evidence that witchcraft has actually happened. And he hears that um, Ruth sleeps, yet she walks and she cannot eat. This is what the Putnams tell him. He hears that Betty tried to fly. He hears that Betty can't bear to hear the Lord's name. He hears that the girls were dancing in the forest. This is what Paris tells him. And Mrs. Putnam confesses to conjuring the spirits of the dead Putnam babies by getting Tituba to do this at the request of her daughter, Ruth Putnam. And we wonder why Mrs. Putnam would confess to this. Isn't she taking the risk of being accused of witchcraft herself? But I think it can be argued that she feels so safe in her senior position in Salem society that she's quite confident that if anyone gets punished for this, it'll be Tituba, not her. And also she has the excuse of her absolute belief that all of her other babies were murdered. And this was her desperate last resort to find out who killed them, who bewitched them, who destroyed their souls during or soon after birth. Remember that satire is mockery or making fun of a political or social structure or attitudes. So things that can be satirized and are often satirized in this play are things like politicians, the church, courts, justice, levels of education, etc. So Hale seems to be reasonable, but Miller does satirize his confidence because what Miller is satirizing is again this oversimplistic, dualistic worldview. So Hale tells the people of Salem, we cannot look to superstition in this. The devil is precise. The marks of his, president, of his presence are definite as stone. And I must tell you that all that, I must tell you all that I shall not proceed unless you're prepared to believe me if I should find no bruise of hell upon her. Notice as well that Miller is implying Hale's integrity here. Hale is not determined to prove that anyone is actually a witch. He wants to find the truth. And Miller does uh, describe how previously in the town of Beverly, he had actually found a woman innocent of witchcraft because he realized that she was just old and confused and eccentric and that her supposed victim just needed food and a bit of kindness. And so there where he was offered the opportunity to find someone guilty of witchcraft, he actually found them innocent. So Hale is presented as a man who is as rational as it was possible to be at the time, but still the victim of this very uh, simplistic, dualistic worldview. Um, and again, he says, um, when he talks about his books, he says, here is all the invisible world, caught, defined, and calculated. In these books, the devil stands stripped of all his brute disguises. And of course, as we go through the play, we realize that if the devil is a character in this play, he's very well disguised. No one ever actually identifies evil, when, even when they're looking at it in the face. Here are all your familiar spirits, your incubi and succubi, your witches that go by land, by air and by sea, your wizards of the day and of the night and of the day. Have no fear now. We shall find him out if he has come among us. And I mean to crush him utterly if he has shown his face. And of course, the irony of this play is that the only person who ever actually committed witchcraft that we know for a fact was Abigail Proctor. I mean, Abigail sorry, Abigail Paris, when she drank blood in an effort to create a charm that would kill Elizabeth Proctor. And she is the only person that is never actually convicted of witchcraft. Right, we also at this point um, have what seems like a little diversion into a little bit about Giles Corey. So Giles Corey is described as Miller, by Miller as a man that was remarkably innocent. Um, he says he was with all a deeply innocent and brave man, even though he was a crank and a nuisance. And we wonder why Giles Corey comes in at this point and he starts asking Hale about what it means that when he tries to say his prayers and his wife Martha Corey is reading her books, he can't pray. 
And I think the reason that Miller introduces Corey at this point is because Corey is a symbol of the innocent victims of the witchcraft trials and in Miller's time of the McCarthy trials. Corey is a character that genuinely believes that the courts are there to uncover and discover the truth and that they will do so. He trustingly gives evidence against his own wife. He doesn't realize he's giving evidence against his own wife. But later on, the fact that he said that he couldn't pray when she was reading her books is twisted to um, be evidence that she is a witch. And if we look at the contrast between what was seen as witchcraft and the real explanation, we can see how Miller is satirizing the kind of evidence that was accepted as realistic evidence, both in the witchcraft trials and in the McCarthy trials. Because Miller explains that Giles Corey had been married three times and that he had never been involved much with the church or saying prayers until he married his third wife, Martha. And that she stopped his prayer is very probable, but he says it's because he had only recently learned any prayers and it didn't take much to make him stumble over them. So the fact that his wife was re reading her books rather than praying with him meant that he couldn't remember his prayers. It wasn't because she was a witch. So at this point, Paris, having heard all the evidence that Betty and Ruth are probably possibly actually um, witches, gets very frightened. And he says to, to Hale in fright, how can it be the devil? Why would he choose my house to strike? We have all manner of licentious people in the village. Notice that Paris is acting true to form. It's all about Paris. He really doesn't want to be have anyone in his house accused of witchcraft, not because he cares particularly about Abigail and Betty, but because he feels that he might lose his ministry. And then Hale very innocently says something which I think makes him change his mind and makes him change his attitude towards witchcraft accusations. Hale says, what victory would the devil have to win a soul already bad? It is the best the devil wants and who better than the minister? And you can imagine the light going off in, in Paris's head. It occurs to him, if I lead the trials against witchcraft, maybe my ministry won't be threatened. Maybe my power will actually be consolidated. Maybe I will be seen as the best in the village. That's why the devil has targeted me. Maybe I'll be seen as God's man. Maybe people will stop trying to remove me from this ministry and I will be secure. So, it's at this point when Hale starts asking Betty leading questions. So a leading question is a question that's got a built-in answer. And of course, it's, it's a question that would never normally be allowed in a court because it means that what you get from your witness is not the truth. You get from your witness what you're essentially telling them to say. So for example, Hale says to, to Betty, does someone afflict you, child? It need not be a woman, mind you, or a man. Perhaps some bird invisible to others comes to you. Perhaps a pig, a mouse, or any beast at all. Is there some figure bids you fly? And I think it's no accident that later on when the girls um, act as though they're bewitched, they act exactly as though an animal has come and possessed them. And they act as though something is trying to make them fly. Uh, those ideas are planted in their heads. And it's at this point that Paris starts giving evidence against Abigail and by implication against his own daughter and the other girls. So he talks about how he saw them dancing in the forest around a kettle, which is basically a cauldron or a pot, like a witch's cauldron, and how he saw something alive in the kettle. Abigail, of course, tries to defend herself. She says, no, they were just dancing, that in fact all that was in the pot was soup and lentils, that if there was something alive in the, in the pot, it was something that jumped in there by accident. Um, it was even just a little frog. But then when Hale persists in his accusations and he says, um, why are you concealing? Have you sold yourself to Lucifer? Lucifer. 
she realizes, I think at that point, that she's not going to get away with her lies. So she then resorts to accusing somebody else. She displaces the blame. And she turns on Tichiba and she says, she made me do it. She made Betty do it. She made me drink blood. And then she starts using evidence from her behavior that everybody knows about to prove that Tichiba had actually possessed her. So she, she actually twists the truth. So she says, she sends her spirit out on me in church. She makes me laugh in prayer. Now, of course, Abigail at this point has a bad reputation. Everyone knows that Abigail has a reputation for last, laughing in prayer. And here Abigail very cleverly uses that against Tichiba. She says, she's always making me dream corruptions. Sometimes I wake and find myself standing in the open doorway and not a stitch on my body. And of course, Abigail is very, very clever. She knows that here she's manipulating her largely male audience because she knows that they are picturing, picturing her naked. And of course, in this very, very repressed society, this is the closest these men get to actually um, having any sort of access to pornography. And of course, Miller, in his long prose passage at the start of Act One, explains that one of the motivations for the witchcraft accusations was it gave people an opportunity to say what they could normally never say. It gave them an opportunity to confess their darkest, deepest, and most wicked desires without being punished because the bonus was they could accuse someone else of having made them behave or feel that way. So he says, the witch hunt was not, however, a mere oppression. It was also, and as importantly, a long overdue opportunity for everyone so inclined to express publicly his guilt and sins under the cover of accusation against the victims. One could not ordinarily speak such things in public. So you can imagine Abigail's audience gasps in horror when she describes how she's naked. And of course, she's referring to the fact that she probably often did um, lie around in her bedroom naked because she was waiting and hoping that Paris, that, sorry, not Paris, that Proctor would come and visit her. So now we come to the point where Abigail accuses Tichiba and Tichiba goes on to confess and name others. And we need to think about why this happens. And it's got a lot to do with power. So at this point, the power structure in Salem is that Paris and the Putnams seem to be allied in a power structure against the Proctors, the Corys, and the nurses. The next layer in the hierarchy that has less power is Abigail and Betty. They are still accused of witchcraft, although they have now accused Tichiba. Tichiba has less power than them because she is a victim of racism, she is a slave, she is a woman of color, she has absolutely no rights in the society. But there is another layer that we find out about that is going to be introduced. And these are the women that have been rejected by Salem society. These are women like Sarah Good, Goody Osborne, and Bridget Bishop. And they are complete outsiders and social outcasts because they're drunks. They're homeless. They have a reputation for having casual sex. And all of these things mean that they cannot possibly be good Christians or good Puritans. They are already borderline witches. So why does Tichiba now start naming names? Why does she confess to witchcraft? Well, first of all, she's terrified. Paris threatens her to whip her to death. And then he threatens to hang her. And because she's a slave with no rights, he can do this and nobody can stop him. By contrast, Hale is kind. Hale says that they will help Tichiba, that if she confesses, it is a Christian act and that she must confess out of her love for the children. And we know she loves the children because we saw her concern for Betty at the very beginning of Act One. 
She probably does believe that the children are actually possessed. Remember that the people of Salem, including their slaves, believed absolutely in the power and the presence of witches. And she has no explanation for why Betty is behaving the way that she is. She also knows that she was in the forest conjuring up the spirits of the dead and that she cast a spell for Abigail to kill Elizabeth Proctor. Hale goes on to ask her, ask her leading questions. So he asks her, um, did you ever see um, Sarah Good? Did you see Osborne? Did you see other people with, with um, the devil? So she knows already who she can accuse because she knows what answers Hale and Paris are expecting. And bear in mind that these are people that had an absolute terror of the devil. They believed that this is literally what had happened in the forest the night before. That Abigail and Tituba had been in some kind of unholy communion with a literal figure of the devil. A guy with horns, with big leathery wings, with a forked tail, with hooves that personified evil. So... Another reason that Tituba probably confesses is that she can be honest as well as Abigail about her very real desires. So she says that the devil told her that Mr. Paris must be killed. Mr. Paris, no goodly man. Mr. Paris, mean man and no gentle man. And he bid me rise out of my bed and cut your throat. And of course, we know that as a slave, Tichipa probably did want to murder Paris. She hated him. She knew he was evil. And she describes how the devil said to her, you work for me, Tichipa, and I make you free. I give you pretty dress to wear, and you go and fly back to Barbados. And touching me, and really sadly, we know that as a slave woman, this is all she really wants. Such simple things. She wants freedom. She wants a pretty dress. She wants to go back to the island of, of Barbados where she was originally captured and made a slave. And we actually see at the beginning of Act, four, of Act 4 how she longs to go back to Barbados. Some important imagery that comes up in this um, portion of the, of the Act is the animal imagery and the imagery of a supernatural battle. So Hale says to Tituba to encourage her to confess, and he's talking here about Betty. Look at her God-given innocence. Her soul is tender. We must protect her, Tituba. The devil is out and preying on her like a beast upon the flesh of the pure lamb. God will bless you for your help. And of course, he's portraying Betty as being like Christ. Christ it is often symbolized as the Lamb of God, the pure, innocent victim. And you can see that in the top picture on the right-hand side. And pre presenting Betty as a lamb shows that she's vulnerable, she's innocent, she's completely defenseless. And the devil is presented, by contrast, as this predator that is literally eating into her soul and into her flesh. And, of course, Tituba is offered the no-brainer decision of, is she going to be on the side of God and heaven and goodness, which is symbolized by, tellingly, a white lamb, or is she going to be on the side of the devil and evil and ruthlessness? Is she going to side with the devil in the destruction of her beloved Betty? And, of course, it's not hard for Tituba to make that decision. So at this point, Abigail and Betty are probably are actually safe. They have completely deflected all blame for witchcraft onto Tituba. They've um, got everyone to believe that the reason for their behavior is that they were possessed by Tituba's evil spirit the night before in the forest. And yet, when they watch Tituba naming names, they suddenly decide that they're going to name names as well. And you've got to ask yourself, why do they do this? So Miller describes it as Abigail rises, staring as though inspired and cries out, I want to open myself. And everyone turns to her startled. She is enraptured as though in a pearly light. 
As she is speaking, Betty is rising from the bed, a fever in her eyes, and picks up the chant. Notice that in Miller's stage directions, he says, it's as though Abigail is inspired, and as though she is in a pearly light. A pearly light would be the light of heaven. So he is implying that she's pretending that she has gone over to the side of God and goodness and heaven. Now, you could argue that she does this because she really believes that she has been evil. She wants to convert. She wants to be on the side of God. Or perhaps as she watches Tichuba naming names, it occurs to her that if she names names as well, she could be very, very powerful. And so Abigail and Betty both start naming many, many names. And the curtain falls on their ecstatic cries. Note that ecstatic means very, very happy. So one of the things you want to consider is why do Betty and Abigail name these names? And I think quite a logical answer is if you look at what happens to them in terms of the power structure in Salem as a result of their accusations. So at the beginning of this um, of this act, they were right near the bottom of this power hierarchy. They had only a little more power than Tichuba does. But now that they have named names, we have had a complete change in the power hierarchy in Salem. So at the top, we've got Paris and the Putnams, who are now on the side of Abigail and Betty. So you can see that by naming names, Abigail and Betty are actually gaining some of the power of the theocracy. Because they are leading the crying out against witches, the naming of names, they have Paris and the church's power. And they are ranged against the proctors, the Corys, and the nurses, because the proctors, the Corys, and the nurses seem to be very cynical about whether or not witchcraft exists at all. And they are certainly very cynical about the Putnam's and Paris's motives for uh, crying out against witchcraft. Below them on that hierarchy is Tichuba. Notice that even though Tichuba named names, because she is a woman of color, because she is a victim of racism and slavery, she is never actually completely pardoned or exonerated. And I think it's interesting that she is a woman of color because remember throughout this play, it's a Eurocentric play. Black is associated with evil. Tichuba is a slave from the Barbados. It was very easy for these people in Salem to believe that because Tichuba had come from the Barbados, which traditionally did not practice Christianity, that she was, even though she was a converted Christian, she was already tending towards witchcraft as a woman of color, as a woman with a non-Christian background, as a slave, as a person of color. They would have seen her in racist terms as um, uncivilized and potentially a devil worshiper. Of course, below her in that power hierarchy, you have Sarah Good, Goody Osborne, and Bridget Bishop. And the reason I think that these were the first people that were accused of witchcraft after Tichuba is because they were social outcasts. They were drunks, they were homeless, they have casual sex. The ruling classes of Salem would like nothing more than to actually get rid of them. And of course, when they are accused of witchcraft, it is all too easy for the Paris for Paris and the Putnams to believe that they did actually commit witchcraft. So you can see how power has shifted in Salem. And you can also see how reputation is so important in who does and doesn't have power. Because now Abigail and Betty have a reputation for being on the side of God. Um, but also notice that this good, re this good reputation and this power comes at the cost of integrity. They've had to lie in order to gain power, as has Tichuba. And of course, this reflects on the USA and the McCarthy trials at the time of Miller's writing, because the people that had power under McCarthy were those that were prepared to lie in order to 
give themselves a good reputation and also in order to undermine the reputation of others. So they sacrifice their integrity for power and a good reputation. So some things to think about. We've discussed why Abigail and Betty name the names they do and who they name. I think we've mentioned why they are ecstatic or happy at the end of Act 1. Firstly, they are no longer vulnerable to accusations of witchcraft. They're safe. Secondly, they've gained a lot of power. And that's what they gain in naming names. It's an interesting question whether or not they really believe they are bewitched because um, you could argue, I think, that Betty possibly does, that she's infected by a kind of mass hysteria because Abigail's calling out names, she calls out names as well without really thinking. But Abigail, to me at least, comes across as so calculating that it's hard to believe that she believes that she is actually bewitched. I think she may believe that she has the power of witchcraft, and that's certainly why she probably um, drank blood and cast a spell against Elizabeth Proctor. It's interesting to consider whether or not Hale, Paris, and the Putnams actually believe Abigail and Betty. Um, certainly Hale uh, is a man of great integrity and right up until the end of Act 2 he seems to believe that there are genuinely witches in Salem and at this point he definitely seems to believe that Betty and, and um, Abigail have been bewitched, that Tichiba was bewitched and that Goody Osborne and Bridget Bishop and um, Sarah Good were probably guilty of witchcraft. Paris, we know, has always suspected that the girls committed witchcraft. And um, it's hard to believe that he now suddenly thinks that Abigail is a good and God-fearing girl. He's lived with her for a very long time. He knows how manipulative she is. He knows how much she lies. He knows what a good actor she is. So I think his belief in her accusations is probably because it is convenient. And the Putnams probably also go along with these accusations because it gives them power. It also gives them an opportunity to get revenge because their own children and babies have died. And Mrs. Putnam is particularly eager for revenge. Thomas Putnam, of course, is eager to gain land from everyone who he feels has land that shouldn't have land. And later on, he uses the witchcraft trials as a way of accusing people and gaining their land when their land goes to the state and he's the only person with enough money to bid on that land. So you can see how the tension between Paris, the Putnams, and the Proctors, Nurses, and Corys actually makes the witchcraft accusations possible. It makes the society very, very vulnerable to the manip manipulations of Abigail and the girls and how they fight for and manipulate in order to gain power. So just to summarize the basic plot of Act 1, in Act 1 we start off with Abigail and Betty being incredibly vulnerable. We know that they were in the forest, they were dancing, they did commit witchcraft. We know that Paris believes they committed witchcraft. He interrogates Abigail on the subject. He knows that she's got a bad reputation. He seems to suspect that she has a bad reputation because she actually had an affair with John Proctor. When Proctor comes in and Abigail speaks to him, we get evidence that Abigail hates Elizabeth and that Abigail loves John Proctor and that she wants to have an ongoing relationship with John Proctor. It's probably why she goes on to later accuse Elizabeth Proctor of witchcraft. We also find out from Betty that Abigail actually tried to commit murder and she actually tried to commit witchcraft. She drank blood in a supernatural attempt to murder Elizabeth Proctor. And then in this half of of the, of the act, we see how Paris changes his story. He goes from believing, saying that he doesn't think witchcraft happened to saying that he thinks it does, it did. And Abigail changes her story, claiming innocence to actually claiming that she did commit witchcraft, but she was possessed. And she goes from having no power to being all powerful. But 
always remember that actually Paris and Abigail haven't changed. They may have changed their stories, but their personalities haven't changed. They remain ultimately and completely selfish and self-serving. And that is going to play out in the tragedy of the witchcraft trials that occur in the next three acts. Thank you.